This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Isaac Zafarti, the Executive Director of Stand With Us UK, which is a British charity, an educational charity, informing people about Israel and countering misinformation that can lead to anti-Semitism. And Isaac, like many other people, has had his work cut out since October the 7th. So, Isaac, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, Isaac, you, you work on campuses, in schools and elsewhere. Perhaps if you can start by trying to describe the gap between people's general perception of Israel and the reality of what Israel actually is. It seems to me that this gap is seems to be getting only wider and wider with each passing month. Yes. So um, first of all, again, thank you very much for having me here. It's it's a great honor. I think that um, you know people tend to see Israel problems and specifically the conflict, uh, maybe like any other political aspect, as something that is very clear, obvious, black and white. But in fact, it's much more complicated than what people think. And in order to get, um, um, I would say, a credible um, decision or uh, like um, um, or like a firm decision about who is right and who is wrong and where are the problems, I think that people need to know a lot. And, you know, as, as, as an Israeli who are monitoring the Israeli media and also monitoring the uh, Arab media and obviously uh, the media in the West, uh, the gaps are huge. And what we, what we are trying to do is to mitigate those gaps and to bring people information that they are not necessarily can acquire from the mainstream media. And I also think that it's, it's, it's not an issue of right and wrong. Uh, a person that thinks that Israel is only right, or on the other hand, the Palestinians are only right, I think that that's a sign for a strong ignorance. Uh, because obviously there is huge complexity and only if you are in the details, you can get get a proper decision and, and a stance with regards to specific topics. Right, but I think that I mean you're you're absolutely right that it, it is a a complex area and there are lots of competing claims for rights and wrongs and lots of nuance and history. But sometimes things are cruder than that, and the debate is more black and white. For example, a story that's just come out today, uh, unheard, carried out some polling which found that most young people think that the state of Israel should not exist. Amongst 18 to 24 year olds, 54% of people mm -hmm. think the state of Israel should not exist. And that declines uh, with as as the age increases. So 60 people over the age of 65, only 7% of people think Israel should not exist. I mean, these are startling figures. It's not a matter of right or wrong in terms of the detail, but certainly it feels to me as if a question of right or wrong morally. For sure, but I think that this is the outcome. This is an outcome of a situation of people who are dealing with a very complicated topic, uh, who are exposed to misinformation, uh, who has maybe uh, no, um, uh, you know, we're living in a very complex uh, era when uh, then the new generation, they, are, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, time to read and to delve into the details. Uh, and I think that the the uh, the survey that you just quoted is a very good example uh, for how people how people dividing uh, or splitting um, crucial topics like the conflict to black and white. Getting to this conclusion is obviously something that based on uh, um, lack of information, uh, and and I think that there is also a huge aspect of trend here. People uh, hate Israel as part of a trend. I think that the Palestinians um, are responsible for one of the most successful campaigns, maybe in modern history, uh, relating the hate towards Israel into human rights, into uh, um, um, like uh, peaceful object objectives. Uh, obviously, this is uh, completely the opposite, but that, that's something that, that, that you know, uh, um, brings many, many young people to think that they're in the right side of history, while in fact, they're doing exactly the opposite. Yeah, I mean, I noticed this recently when Egypt joined the case at the ICJ, accusing Israel of genocide. I mean, it was it was laughable. I mean, Egypt uh, itself has an extremely poor track record on human rights. 
uh, involving the detention of political prisoners, torture, forced expulsion, uh, and notably has not opened its border to any refugees from Gaza. So to then suddenly say that it's very concerned about about Israel's behavior was so hypocritical. It was it was obvious that Egypt was using the language of human rights. Yeah, and, and that's, pressure no, on Israel. That, that's a great yeah. point. And I think that something that many of our young generation, they don't understand. Look, you and I, uh, we both live in, in the democratic countries. Most of the students that are protesting on campus are coming from democratic countries and uh, were educated on a democratic values. The countries, and the organization that they allegedly support are not democratic at all. And you, you, the reference that you just gave to Egypt uh, is obviously a political move in order to appease the population in Egypt that are mostly anti-Israel. So it doesn't matter whether the president of Egypt thinks that uh, uh, or wants to support Israel, he is trying to gain popularity among his people. But, uh, but the other interesting... Monitor. Right. But I mean, the other interesting uh, sort of coda to that episode uh, is that it seemed to me that Egypt was trying desperately to stop the IDF from going into Rafah. Why? Because it will find the tunnels. It will uh, destroy the tunnels. It will stop the weapons smuggling. It will stop the lucrative payments to the Egyptian military chiefs that they receive in order to, to keep Hamas alive. Um, and it feels like this is a good example, a good symbol, because all around the world, in the in the UN and elsewhere, international diplomacy, the international community, um, people are using the language of human rights to advance an agenda which is totally different to human rights, which is actually seeking to choke off support for the only democracy in the Middle East and uh, and try to undermine it over time and cause it to be dismantled. And often it's the states, I was talking about this last week with Hillel Neuer from UN, uh, UN Watch, Often it's the states who have the least respect themselves for human rights that shout the loudest about human rights when it comes to, to Israel. It's obvious and it's transparent, but this has dominated the discourse in the public as well as on the international stage. And I'm just wondering, how can you, how do you find a way of talking about human rights that doesn't play into this weaponization of human rights against Israel? Because it's not like you don't, and supporters of Israel don't care about human rights. Of course they do. They care about civilian casualties and, and, and the rule of law. Uh, but all of that, that language has been weaponized, hasn't it, so much against Israel. How is it possible to find a way to talk about it that doesn't play into that narrative? So first of all, start talking about Israel on campuses, in, on schools here. Uh, you are starting from a very uh, uh, low point. Uh, you're starting from a significant disadvantage. First of all, you need to uh, get the privilege to even get into your university. Um, uh, in some universities, even uh, asking to speak uh, is something that they will uh, prohibit it under the accusation that you, you are uh, um, 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 illegitimate, that you, you just can't even have the right to, to, to express yourself. Uh, in schools, they will tell you that it will uh, just uh, inflaming the atmosphere to discuss those topics. Obviously, when it comes to the other side, they're not giving those arguments. But once you 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 get you get the opportunity to discuss that again, um, I would separate between those who really wants to listen and to learn, and they are open. Uh, and sometimes you know, you know, even if you will share the facts with them, they will tell you, "Look, we disagree. We still think that Israel is doing the wrong thing," which is fair as long as you based your decision on credible facts. On the other hand, and unfortunately, that's 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 the loud minority, if you like, is those people who turn the hate towards Israel to a cult. And you just cannot discuss with those people because no matter what you will say, they will stop you. And there is a very interesting thing to see that as long as you share with them more facts that contradict what they believe in, because they less care about facts, it's a matter of belief, they want to stop listening to you. They don't want to listen to you. They say, look, look, I don't even want to listen to you uh, because listening to you is like listening to uh, a Nazi propaganda uh, on the 30s. So it's very challenging. And we are trying to get to the 80 percent that are in the middle, that are willing to listen, that are willing to learn. Uh, but obviously, it's very hard. Yes, it's hard. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, you know, the argument that I'm, I, I make in, in my book is um, is about uh, about Israelophobia. And the idea is that within the, the realm of facts, people can disagree and have a range of different reasonable perspectives on Israel, uh, you know, its presence on the West Bank and and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then as soon as you begin to 
base your arguments on lies or misinformation of the sort that has characterized anti-Semitism for thousands of years, then that's when it becomes anti-Semitic or Israelophobic, as I call it in my book. But it feels to me as if the, the misinformation is so widespread that you can't even get to reasonable disagreement on the facts because nobody knows the facts. People are just deep in the anti-Semitism. Uh, and so hauling them out of that is the first challenge, isn't it? How do you go about that? So you work in, let's start with campuses. So you said that you've managed to get into some campuses and others have tried to just tried to close you down. I mean, campuses have been all over the news recently with these in encampments and these sort of almost fanatical uh, protesters against Israel. How do you begin to try to create some kind of healthy dialogue? So, um, um, obviously, you know, the Jewish students and the pro-Israeli students are uh, your first point of contact uh, because uh, doing that through them is maybe the only way to uh, um, to get an opportunity to discuss with people or to share thoughts and ideas and facts. Uh, and, and I'm going to say something that is uh, it's a bit difficult, but unfortunately, we are recognized the trend lately, recently, I would say in the past year, in the past year and a half, that even getting into campuses through Jewish societies becomes challenging hmm. because they themselves think that even raising the issue of Israel uh, might interpret it as a provocation that might harm them. Uh, and I think that the reason is, is that the pressure that the anti-Israeli groups puts on uh, almost every institution, every organization, not to even mention this fact, unless, and, and if they will do so, they will boycott them, they will chase them, they will, you know, protest against them, brings even the supporters to try to load the profile in a hope that in the future things will get better. Right. So uh, the bottom line is that it become harder and harder. And you find, I suppose, within student groups on universities, Jewish student groups, a lot of intimidation, like you say, the instincts to try to keep quiet, keep their heads down so as not to be seen as being provocative, which yeah. is outrageous, given that that the country they're supporting is the only democracy in the Middle East. But also, as I said, with, as I brought up with that, news today of the of, of young people thinking Israel shouldn't exist. I suppose there's a, also a, a phenomenon of Jewish young people on the left absorbing some of those views as well, isn't there? Does that present you with a challenge as well? Yeah. So, you know, those groups sometimes think that in order to prove their loyalty to uh, human rights values, they even, need, they even need to hate Israel more because there is some kind of expectancy from them to distance themselves from this. Uh, because they're Jewish. Uh, yeah, and to show that as part of their moral values as Jews, Israel, they need to show that Israel is illegitimate and, and to even echo harder and, and louder that Israel is doing uh, the wrong things. And, you know, and there is one common denominator in all those um, um, situations. When you start sharing fact after fact, number after number, and they and you're just pushing them to the corner, suddenly they want to stop engage with you and they think that you're just like a lie. Uh, and, and I see it as a good sign because, you know, if they would have um, answers, facts they could share to counter our arguments, they would do it. But since they can't, so they're pulling the easiest tool, and which is to say, look, you're illegitimate. I'm not going to speak with you anymore. And you're not going to enter campus anymore. Um, and yeah, so th th this yeah. group are, are very vocal. Can you give me a, a, an example of a success that you've had on campus, either small or large, but just give me an example of what a success looks like for you? Yeah, so a success is um, usually you need to find or to locate a, a group of brave students that are willing to uh, forfeit or to put in jeopardy their relationships with their professors there sometimes the relationship with their friends. Uh, we have some stories that you know, uh, due to privacy, I wouldn't be able to share them to share them here. But but students that paid significant prices on the personal level, on the on, on the academic level, just because they strongly believe that they have to uh, raise the torch and to to share what they believe, um, and and then with those students 
uh, you get an opportunity uh, to meet many other students uh, that they're, 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 they're just looking for the opportunity to, that they don't want to lead or to initiate an event, but they are, much, they are very happy to come and join. And they're just looking at this opportunity. And then, you know, we, we see it with numbers. Uh, so when you can give students the option to listen to different point of view, uh, and you get like a full venue and people are queuing outside uh, and you have waiting lists, then you realize that you have this silent majority that just feel scared to, 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 to engage with those kind of things. But when it's, it's a huge group of people, they, they are getting braver. Right. So in a way, it's, it's a matter of creating a small group of people who are brave enough to go first and to speak up, and then they will attract other people who are maybe less brave, but still still willing to follow them. And then before you know it, they attract people who are less brave, but follow, but follow them. And then you can create a phenomenon where you create a, a momentum. Uh, to, I, will to take it, I will take it even one step further. I think that people don't recognize how big is the silent majority on campuses and on the streets, by the way, as well. The only thing that those people are looking for, they are so intimidated. The only thing that they are looking for is that they will have like a strong body, huge body that will back them, that will give them the umbrella to get under, and then they will come up and step forward. And that's what we are trying to do on campuses, on the streets. Uh, they just need this backup because they're really scared to lose their job, uh, to lose their academic degree, or to be even to affect it socially. Right. And I suppose also there are people who might, on the whole, stand against or feel worried about this strong anti-Israel movement, but they sort of doubt themselves. They haven't got the strength to stand up because the other side is so is so common. It's all around them. It's so ubiquitous. And the sense of support is 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 not that strong. They don't have access to it, and so they think, well, maybe maybe I'm not right, and, and they're not strong enough to stand up. They'd rather just go and watch the football. I'm very happy you mentioned that because you know when October seventh took place, happened. I asked myself, what is my mission now? How uh, we have this amazing tool that calls Stand with Us UK. The reality is changing in front of our eyes. What do we need to do now? Where we need to focus? And obviously, you know, many people always told us, and that's something that we always invested on, go and speak with the non-Jewish uh, communities. Speaking to the Jews is preaching to the choir. And in October 7th, I recognized the trend that there are many, many, many Jewish people who in their heart support Israel, want to support Israel, and they don't have the tools, yeah. and they are too scared. And then, and therefore, we focused on them. Uh, we focused on educating them, giving them the fact, and we saw... Uh, how people empowered by that, how it gave them more confidence to go and to step forward. And, you know, we, we just ran a survey among our six formers and we asked them uh, uh, if they feel more confident uh, after one of our sessions uh, in comparison to just, I don't know, uh, getting or acquiring information from social media. And 80%, and it was anonymous uh, uh, survey, said that they feel much more confident when they have the set of all the facts organized by a timeline, it makes it much more easier for them to counter back. And there are many people who, you know, finding themselves at work, working with like, obviously with non-Jewish people and, and, and anti-Israeli people, and they're start engaging and discussing those topics and they're taking a step back because they don't know what to say. And now, and they have now more confidence to do so. And th that, that's our food. That's what we're trying to do. Right. So let's talk about schools. Um, I mean, universities have been so much in the press recently, but schools have not. Uh, what's the um, environment like in, in schools with regard to attitudes towards towards Israel and, and how does it compare to, to, to campuses? Yeah, so I would again uh, separate uh, Jewish schools and non-Jewish schools. In non-Jewish schools, it's like it's almost impossible. Uh, and in the rare cases that we are invited by, by a student or by a parent. Uh, and you know what, I just, we had uh, an issue today uh, with one of the schools. Uh, one of the students approached us and asked us to come and speak. Uh, it's an Jewish schools. And uh, uh, moments later, we got uh, a, another letter from the students that one of the teachers said that uh, sometimes they have like, you know, 
uh, excuses, logistic, administration, but some of them, uh, like just saying straightforward, bringing you on campus will inflame the environment, the, the atmosphere. People will, will we don't want you there. We prefer to keep it silent. Uh, so in non-Jewish schools, it's much, much harder. Uh, in Jewish schools, most of them are very like letting us come and actually asking us to come and, and speak in front of their uh, student. Some of them even giving us like a weekly slot to come and to educate about Israel, which is amazing. And uh, only in the past year, we reached almost uh, uh, more than 5,000 students, uh, which is a lot. It means that 5,000 students actually participated in deep sessions and it, it's great. But there is also a trend where you see Jewish parents prefer not to engage with those topics because they are afraid that it will, you know, push their kids uh, or put their kids at, at risk. Uh, if their kid will uh, be over-engaged with Israel and will decide to participate in rallies and will get to, uh, uh, I don't know, to discussions with their friends, it might put them in jeopardy. And we're getting those responses as well. And that that's very concerning. That's very concerning. You know, it's... Um... My kids go to a non-Jewish school and we live outside of London. Um, I think they're probably one of a very small number of Jews in the school. Um, and it's clear to me, I mean, Israel has not really come up. It's sort of something that the, that they try to avoid uh, studiously, as if uh, like, like you've just described. Uh, but I have had discussions with the school after noticing that there's a lot of political content that's uh, present in the school, um, uh, such as pro-trans stuff, such as uh, radical race, Black Lives Matter material, um, all of the things that when you hear people um, uh, pushing those sorts of ideas, you know that Palestine is not far far away from their hearts. You know, it's all part of the same thing. Yes. Um, and I've I've had discussions with the school, and they've they've begun to limit that sort of stuff because they realize according to the education act a school is supposed to be politically neutral and it seems to me that often some of the young teachers uh, are the ones who are introducing some of these ideas maybe they've picked it up from university they become involved with this kind of activism which includes pro-palestine activism and then bring it into their professional life with you know when they become teachers thinking that the right thing to do is to educate kids in that ideology as well and there have been a couple of incidents with my kids where they've encountered um anti-jewish or uh anti-israeli sentiments from teachers uh in their class um uh it, it, uh I, I probably won't shouldn't go into too much detail for fear of identifying uh, uh specifics but um it feels to me like a, a big problem is the framework just like you have lecturers who are upholding this ideology it's teachers as well, isn't it? Particularly the younger teachers, as, as that as that um, survey that I mentioned described. Look, in schools, uh, there is a very clear standard that education has to be balanced. And uh, at least, you know, unfortunately, there is a double standard because when it comes to the other side, it's completely political. But when we want to come and share some facts, it immediately becomes political. And right, I think so sorry, so, so the other side is the, the other side is perceived as neutral human rights. Yes, although the they are side is you know, being political. Yeah, right. yeah, and, and I, I must say, like I I I am very familiar with some of the content, and I'm promising I'm promising you that, that's not like it's actually like a pro-Palestinian sessions yeah. in a disguise of promoting human rights and helping minorities. Mm. So it's completely purely political. Uh, our content, on the other hand, is much more moderate because when we are delivering content, we are dealing with both sides. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not covering it. We are bringing the, the, the Israeli story, but we are also touching problems and we are creating like balanced dis discourse. But we are on we we are always facing this argument of you are not balanced. They are balanced. So I think that if there is one lesson that we learned from the encampments in the U.S. And if we want to prevent the same sites here in the, U in the UK and also the incitement in schools is that we actually need to balance education, but on the other end, mm. to the other end. Mm. Uh, there is like a fiction that the education right now is balanced. It is not balanced. It's leaning towards one side. If we And, and you know, I don't think that it's the Jewish community interest, it's the British society interest to make sure that 
all students will get all the information as, as and as grown up, they will develop their own ideas right. and decisions. And right now, that's not what happens. And schools are on the way to be what the university became, like right. one echo chamber with one opinion that if you just, you know, move a bit, uh, you immediately will be blocked. And it's not only with Israel, by the way, it's with other, you just mentioned Black Lives Matters and other stuff. And universities, instead of like uh, a continue and flourish as kingdom of ideas, kingdom of free speech, are becoming exactly the opposite. Like there is one uh, um, uh, opinion, one idea, you have to obey it, otherwise you're out. And this idea of balance is an interesting one because, I mean, schools are different from universities in that schools are obliged to be politically neutral right. under the Education Act. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever considered or have you ever done this? Have you ever, um, you know, held a session in which you speak, for example, and then a Palestinian speaks, somebody who uh, is facts based and is reasonable, maybe with a different perspective? Do you ever do joint things like that? Um we uh first of all we, we we did it in the past not in my time i think that today it's almost impossible because as i said they perceived us as like illegitimate we, they, mm. they are, we are not even worth to to be debate with um but i must say that um uh, you know i saw other organization does that and unfortunately there is a lot of manipulation there as well because bringing a palestinian speaker who thinks that uh, Israel is the mother of all evil, and to bring an Israeli speaker that thinks exactly the same, that that is not to uh, right. balance or to diverse. Right. Uh, we are always uh, like open to have this uh, um, discourse, but but it's always hard because schools don't like it. They don't like to like awake those uh, emotional uh, topics. Um, so unfortunately, it's it's almost not happening. I think it's it's probably we'll difficult to find to... difficult yeah. to find the right partner as well. I mean, there was a survey again this week uh, carried out in the West Bank and Gaza uh, that showed that seventy one percent of Palestinians, whether on the West Bank or on Gaza, the figure was the same, think that October the seventh was a good move. Yes. Um, so you know, if, the, if if those are the figures, and people say that it's complex and the responses are not reliable and so forth, but the gist of it, it has has got to have truth to it, um, because it was a legitimate survey. And so if if, if that's the case uh, on the other side, it's it's you know, pe good people obviously exist on the other side without question, with sound values and views um, and worthy partners for de for debate and for discussion and collaboration. But it's a question of finding them and bringing them into the schools is is, is another matter, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's extremely challenging, uh, and I hope that uh, in the future and as part of the conclusions from recent events, schools and universities will be much more open to bring different voices. I think that this is a move that the country needs to lead. It's in the hands of the Minister of Education and the Minister of Higher Education. And as I said before, I don't think that they should do it in order to uh, do a favor to the Jewish community. Uh, it's it's much more important to the British society as a whole to be open, diverse, to get new ideas and not to stay at the same track of idea. Uh, and I think that you see the, the ramifications on the streets and it, it will only get worse. Right. So the message that I'm picking up from you, the thread that's running through everything you're saying is that a lot of your effort actually is spent on energizing, encouraging and adding confidence to people who are already standing on your side on our side if i may you know people who are jewish or people who are pro-israel giving them the confidence and the tools to go out there and actually not be intimidated and not be embarrassed and reaching out is is becoming more and more difficult yeah and and, and, and maybe maybe to sharpen it a bit it, um, our main goal is to share credible and credible information and facts with people we are not trying to convince them to support israel we are happy that they will criticize Israel if they think so, as long as they will do it based on credible information. The fact that the majority of this discourse around Israel based on misinformation and maybe even disinformation, that's the main problem. I think that most of the people out there are quite intelligent. They just need to acquire the proper knowledge and they will get their own decisions. Now, I, Isaac, I, I regularly receive messages from on a daily basis, I would say, pretty much, from 
non-Jewish people um, who I don't know, who've, you know, come across me in some way, read my pieces or see me on TV or read the book or whatever it is, who say, I stand with you. You know, don't don't worry. Don't be intimidated. I'm not intimidated. I'm standing up and who share my worldview and, and want to, to speak out. Um, those people are there, aren't they, uh, in, in every age group? They are the silent majority. They are the people, and I think, you know, the majority are not against Israel. And I think that they have a very wealthy sense of moral. And I think that every decent people that see a demonstration on the street calling to the annihilation of a state, calling to the annihilation of society, understand that something is wrong here. Because if there is one lesson we learn from history is that you cannot cancel a full society. You cannot cancel uh, a whole country. Uh, something is wrong here. Uh, and those people with healthy sense of, of moral sense, uh, they are on the right side of history. But from there until taking an action, uh, there is a wide gap. And I understand them. Sometimes, you know, people are thinking twice. They don't need to, they don't want to, you know, I, I, again, I, I, since October 7th, so many people approached to us, people who are working in like prestigious workplaces, who just tweeted something to support the hostages and was invited to a hearing before they sacked them because uh, the manager said that they are involving in politics. On the other hand, they have plenty of other employees who are like uh, sharing in, uh, like insightful messages with everybody and that is something that they perceive as, as fine so yeah the problem is there we just need to you know give them the we need to back them up we need to give them the opportunity to stand with us if you like right and it strikes me that there's a certain power that's derived from saying what people believe but don't dare to say exactly you know and w when somebody says it uh, there's some there's a sort of there's a certain moment that i i find that occasionally in in my many thousands of words that i put out every month uh, a, a phrase or a paragraph or a piece seems to derive that quality of expressing something that people have everyone thinks but no one has said because they feel intimidated and suddenly you say it and the reaction is really quite quite moving um and but, it just right it, 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 it's yeah. also woke uh, to the other side because if someone knows that that he has a, like as I said a wealth a, a good sense of morale, and day after day he just hear the other side criticizing and inciting, at some point he will start out himself. Uh, so mm -hmm. we also need to ensure start to doubt himself. You say yeah, exactly. yeah. And, yeah, and exactly. that's why it's so important to allow people to be exposed to different opinions, to all uh, to facts, in order to them to you know stay on the right track. But I think that it really it's uh, I think there's some virtue, isn't there, in trying to find the people who who won't pay a high personal price. I mean, for you know, for me, I, I'm unlikely to be cancelled for being supportive of Israel because I'm editor of the Jewish Chronicle. I'm not working for The Guardian. Um, uh, not that I'm making the comparison, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, but there, and but a lot of people, in fact, probably the majority of people, if they were openly, if they openly expressed their 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 reasonably held moral beliefs, they might face, as you've said, victimization at the workplace, the threat to their life, towards their livelihood, towards their reputation. But there are some people who don't. Maybe they're business people. Maybe they have independent means. Maybe they, for whatever reason, um, they, they they aren't under that threat. And it's those people, I think, who are particularly in need of the confidence and the support to, to speak out because they, they're not going to suffer such grave consequences as other, other people will and become those inspiring voices that say what other people don't dare to say so that we can begin to affect a new norm whereby speaking your mind in line with our morals and our, and, and our national values and our belief in democracy is the right thing to do. You're 100% right. 100% right. I agree with you. Uh, and uh... I know a lot of these people, they are our supporters, people who are willing to step forward. Uh, and you know what, even in a sense, to to, to still take the risk, uh, because I don't think that there is someone who won't pay the price at all. There are no guarantees here. You're taking the risk, you're, step, you're stepping forward because you know that you do something for the future of your society and to, for the future of your kid, whether you're a Jew or, uh, or, 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 or non-Jew. Uh, you know, when I see those protests on the street of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, calling to the annihilation in Israel and, and, and getting the protection of the police and they're like hiding behind the freedom of speech. I'm always asking myself if the same protests of uh, 
uh, 100,000 Russians calling to the destruction of Ukraine well, oh, was also something that, period, that, that the government and the police would perceive as okay because it's part of freedom of speech. So it's all political and right. we cannot accept to, uh, uh, such things to be in the public sphere. Um, and yes, and we trust those people who are willing to step forward with us. And I think that really, when all said and done, it's a it's a question of identifying the, the the fundamentals of the argument. You know that Israel, for all of its faults, and we've talked, we've alluded to its complexities, its lights and its shades. You know that Jewish people have have their own villains, as Jabotinsky put it, as well as their own heroes, like everybody else, because we're human beings. Mm -hmm. um, but for all of that, Israel is the only meaningful democracy in the Middle East. Uh, it, it, it is the only place where minorities, women and so forth can be free. It is the only place in the region that aligns with our beliefs here in Britain and our values. And, and that's just right, isn't it? You know, you, you, you are, if you, if you stand up against, against the, the, the hordes of misinformation and, and stand up in that cause, you are going to be on the right side of history in the end. You know, I often say to people when I talk at, at uh, at events that you know they've got an advantage and we've got an advantage. Their advantage is that they've got the numbers; they've got more people than us. But our advantage is that we happen to be right. <laughs> yeah, and 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 the minor things that we left to do is to convince them that we are right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, on on that note, Isaac, thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for joining me today. And uh, Bahatlacha, hope to see you soon. Thank you for having me. Bye -bye.